um, often as a result of uh, um, Indigenous knowledge being dismissed, First Nations communities in Northern Ontario are disproportionately impacted by forest fires. Um, and so here are some um, recent media examples of the impacts of forest fires, as I mentioned. Um, in, you know, there's been regular displacement of First Nations communities um, in Northern Ontario. Um, we've seen air quality impacts across across Northern Ontario and affecting other provinces as well. Um, I think probably the Fort McMurray fire stands out um, particularly in all of our memories. Um, and you know, Canada is not the only country um, impacted by increases in forest fires. Um, let's see if this is the first test of my PowerPoint making skills and sharing them on Zoom. Um, if you can see this video, um, this is a forest fire outside the city of uh, Samchuk in Kowondo in South Korea last month. Um, this, this fire destroyed at least 159 homes and 46 other buildings. Um, about over 6,000 people were evacuated as a result. Um, some of you might recall um, some fires that were um, out of control in the Pantano, um, the world's largest tropical wetland. Um, last year, and there's some growing concerns that the wetland area might not recover from that fire. Oh, let's see. Now I've got to figure out how to advance my slide. So with that, um, I'll give you a little bit of an agenda for my 20 minutes of time here. Um, for those of you who have called in, uh, saw Dr. Groot on the advertisement, and we're hoping for the Dr. Groot uh, with those glasses in this photo to speak who is actually an expert on um, forestry. Um, I am sorry to disappoint you. Um, I'm his daughter. Um, I'm not an expert in, in forests or forest fires, um, but I'm a public health physician with a particular interest in the health impacts um, of forest fire smoke. Um, so this is a picture of me and my dad from about 25 years ago. Um, and to, he's a climatologist and probably to his disappointment, <laughs> I'm a public health physician. Um, so my agenda, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the forest fire trends in Canada, recognizing that I'm not an expert. Um, so this is sort of my non-expert overview of forest fire trends. And then I'll talk uh, a little bit more in my wheelhouse about the health impacts of forest fires, focusing particularly on smoke. So thinking about, you know, there's lots of health impacts of forest fires, um, but recognizing the air theme, um, I'll, I'll speak um, specifically about the impacts. And then briefly, um, some ways in which we can mitigate some of those impacts in the short term, um, recognizing that ultimately um, fire mitigation uh, will be helpful, but that's again, a little bit outside my wheelhouse. So a little bit of background, um, forest fires can be categorized in, in lots of uh, different ways, um, but one helpful uh, categorization is dividing them into surface fires and crown fires. Um, so as you might suspect, uh, surface fires burn the material near the ground. So things like pine needles or leaves or low shrubs. Um, and surface fires can climb up fire ladders, so uh, dead branches um, or dried out vegetation and become crown fires. Um, crown fires move through the canopy of the forest stand, burning sort of from one treetop to the next. Um, and they have much longer flame lengths uh, and they can um, start spot fires far ahead of the, the fire front, so they can sort of throw embers. Um, the surface fires can also throw embers, but typically not as far as the crown fires. Um, so that means that crown fires are often more destructive um, and can move fast. Um, although there are types of, of surface fires that can move pretty quickly, like, like grass or marsh fires. Um, humans actually start about half of forest fires in Canada, um, but lightning caused fires account for 80 to 90 percent of the area burned, um, and that's because, as you can imagine, you know, if you've got lightning strikes in a remote area, um, they're harder to detect, um, they're harder to put out, and sometimes they're not necessary. You don't have to put them out, right? They're they're not um, they're not close to any uh, human settled areas, um, and you can imagine, you know, um, how difficult it would be in an area um, away from human settlement to detect one of these uh, these lightning strikes. Um, so 
fires are, forest fires uh, are quite complex, but you know, my physician brain will break them down into three pieces. Um, and I'll reference a United Nations Environment Program diagram here. Um, you know, the fire behavior is determined by three major factors, the fuel, the weather, and the topography. So, you know, the fuel in terms of the vegetation type, um, the amount, uh, how dry it is. Um, and, you know, in some parts of Northern Ontario, there's been moves to try to encourage um, planting of you know, fire resistant plants near um, settled areas. So for example, um, high moisture content um, or difficult to burn brush like um, nine bark or um, milkweed. Um, topography, uh, fires burn faster going up hills. Um, as the heat rises, it dries out um, the, the, uh, the forest in front of the fire. Um, and, uh, and that uh, creates um, more intense fire behavior. And then of course, weather. Um, so, you know, uh, winter, not a great forest fire, time for forest fires, um, you know, lots of rain, um, as long as it's not stormy, right? Because that, those lightning strikes are uh, important. Um, and then, you know, the downstream impacts of that, um, there's economic, environmental, and societal impacts, um, although they sort of all intersect, right? You can imagine that, um, you know, damage to infrastructure or assets um, might lead to population displacement um, or uh, homelessness, which ultimately impacts health, or if you have, um, um, erosion as a result of loss of plant material um, that impacts your water quality, which can ultimately impact health as well. Uh, so we'll focus down here on this uh, very far end of the diagram, um, but recognizing that all of these factors are um, interact with one another. Um, so a, a little bit of a background in terms of the trends of forest fires in, in Canada. Um, with a caveat, a big caveat, um, there have been sig really significant changes to land use and vegetation composition in some areas of Canada. Um, we also are better at detecting fires. We're also better at suppressing fires. Uh, so that makes temporal um, comparisons hard to interpret. You know, are we finding more fires because we're better at it? Um, or is less area being burned um, because we're suppressing fires, more successful in suppressing fires? Um, but sort of the overall trend uh, since 1959 that both area burn and the number of large fires, so fires over um, 200 hectares have increased significantly, um, but human fires are, human caused fires are decreasing. Um, and as you probably know, uh, growing for forests absorb a lot of carbon dioxide, um, but forest fires emit a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and so for the last few decades, Canadian forests have been net sources of carbon dioxide, um, not sinks. And that's in part due to fires, but also due to insects, disease, and logging. Um, overall in Canada, the fire season is starting about a week earlier and ending one week later. Um, and so, you know, sort of the, the general trend is that uh, increase, but there's a huge amount of regional variation. So this is the overall trend in Canada. Um, but that's very different, um, you know, looking from west to east. Um, Western Canada is, is sees the significant impact, whereas um, this in, the increase is um, not really impacting Eastern Canada. And even within those sort of geographical areas, um, there's a lot of variation. Um, and what might the future hold? Um, the latest IPCC report predicts an increase in extreme fire weather, um, but uh, there's lots of processes as we looked at in the previous slide that impact wildfire risk. Um, and it makes it a little bit hard to both look at the previous trends and say, you know, what is the underlying cause? Is it climate change? Is it something else? Is it, you know, lots of different things interacting. Um, and those same complexities make it difficult uh, to predict the impacts of climate change on future fire seasons. But again, the sort of general trend is, you know, you've got warmer weather, so you've got longer fire seasons, you know, your snow melts earlier. Um, and so, um, 
you're more at risk uh, throughout a, a longer season. Um, your warmer temperatures also, uh, you know, uh, can increase thunderstorm activities. So you're generating more lightning. And if you recall that the majority of large area burns are related to lightning strikes. Um, and then your warmer temperatures and those longer, um, longer summers um, can also dry out um, fuel. The, um, and then there's also you know, some other climate change impacts that could add um, fuel loads. So for example, um, if there's ice storms or high winds or um, insect damage that can damage, um, that can damage or create dead wood um, that could also uh, increase fire risk. But there are some parts of Canada that are likely to see increased rain and ultimately fewer fires. So if you have increased rain um, throughout a fire season without um, the increased uh, lightning risk, um, some areas of Canada will probably see fewer fires. And again, the impacts will primarily be seen in the, the impacts of increased fires will primarily be seen in Western Canada. Um, in Northern Ontario. At least that's my layperson's interpretation of the complex forestry literature. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind though is that despite their human health impacts, um, not all fires are harmful and not all fires need to be extinguished. Um, fires serve an important ecological purpose. Um, I copied this, uh, this um, painting, Tom Thompson's, the jack pine. Um, jack pine um, cones only open and spread seed after a fire. Um, so without fires uh, and their ecological purpose here, um, we wouldn't be able to propagate jack pine. Um, in the Great Lakes region where I grew up, um, jack pine like these and also red pine are the most flammable tree species and they can um, carry burning embers sort of even kilometers ahead of the fire front. Um, so what else other than burning pine embers, um, uh, you know, can be carried by wildfire smoke? Um, my non-chemist background, I think of basically the smoke and Jane, you can, you can correct me uh, in your talk next. Um, basically smoke to me is the weird stuff that's uh, produced during incomplete combustion. So when I th think about my basic understanding from high school, you know, you've got complete combustion, you've got enough oxygen, all you're going to get is um, water and carbon dioxide. But when you've got incomplete combustion, you start to get some strange things. Um, and so um, that's what you get. We see lots of incomplete combustion in forest fires. Um, so, and the forest fire smoke is then made up of a pretty complex mixture. So you've got some polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons um, like uh, naphthalene. You've got carbon monoxide. Um, you've got benzene. Um, the formation of aldehydes like formaldehyde and acrolein, um, levoglucosin, which is sort of seen as the marker of, of fires, and it's quite reliably produced during forest fires. Um, and of course, fine particulate matter, in some cases, composed of these other things sticking to one another. Um, and so um, I, I'll focus on the health impacts of exposure to these things, so, you know, the constituents of smoke, but with a focus um, on the fine particulate matter. Of course, there's other health effects other than just um, of forest fires, other than exposure to smoke. Um, you know, obviously significant mental health impacts, injuries, water contamination, but focusing on those, um, on those impacts of smoke. Um, the health effects of the particulate matter from wildfire smoke are probably the best understood. Um, but in the short term, um, some of those other components probably have similar effects or, um, you know, group together to make uh, fine particulate matter. So as a reminder, fine particulate matter is any particulate matter less than two, uh, two and a half microns in diameter. Um, and that size is significant because it can be inhaled further into the respiratory system than larger particles. Um, and Inhaling these particles um, irritates the respiratory system and results in inflammations. So you've got eye irritation, runny nose, sore throat, phlegm and cough, wheezing, headache, shortness of breath. You know, anyone who's um, accidentally left something in the oven too long knows about the impacts of, of smoke. And so this is just extended in forest fire season um, for people who are exposed to forest fire smoke. 
Um, most significantly, um, these impacts are experienced by people with pre-existing lung conditions like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, because that respiratory irritation and inflammation can exacerbate their illnesses. Um, and maybe there's an immunologist on the call who can explain this to me, but um, the inflammation and irritation can also make it harder to fight respiratory infections. So in forest fire season, um, in addition to sort of the irritation, um, so uh, like chemical um, bronchitis, um, eMERGE departments tend to see increases in infectious pneumonia and infectious bronchitis as well. Um, and that shortness of breath um, can also exacerbate pre-existing heart disease. So um, sometimes in severe uh, smoke um, events, we see increases in presentation to hospital of myocardial infarctions or heart failure. Um, and then in addition to people with those pre-existing um, conditions, we also see you know, people who are breathing faster, young kids, pregnant women, um, more impacted, um, and then uh, older adults who might have a little less reserve. Um, and so then in terms of um, mitigating these impacts in the short term, um, sort of from a health systems perspective, um, this is a photo from my just above my house here in Sudbury. Um, you can see my <laughs> attempts to create blackout curtains for my son. Um, but this is a view that's obscured by forest fire smoke um, from Northwestern Ontario and Northwestern Ontario, Manitoba. So I'm in Sudbury, so I'm, you know, thousands of kilometers away. Um, and so, you know, some, some things individuals can do during, um, during forest fire season, if there's a forest fire and they're exposed to smoke in their community, um, they can stay inside and um, outdoor cancel outdoor events, um, keep, keep the windows up when driving. Um, augmenting indoor air filtration um, can be helpful. And um, I hope that the focus on air filtration uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic will help um, reduce exposure uh, to air pollutants. Um, and uh, maybe as a public health physician, my particular interest is, is a focus on institutions. Um, I think it's, it's really difficult for us to counsel um, individuals living in private dwellings to improve their air filtration. You know, when, um, you know, if people are renters or um, have other places where they need to spend their funds, it's not an air filtration. This is a really big ask. Um, so alternatively, um, communities can implement clear, clean air shelters. So places like uh, libraries or community centers that implement uh, good air filtration where people can go um, spend some time, um, you know, now that we're used to remote work um, or um, some leisure time in these facilities where the, their burden uh, of exposure to smoke is reduced. For people who do have asthma or COPD action plans to implement those or for people who don't have them um, to work with their primary care provider to put them in place. Um, in, in rare cases, um, evacuation is sometimes recommended um, for severe smoke hazard. Of course, you know, when there's risk of, of physical um, injury or exposure to, to flame or heat source, um, evacuation is recommended. But um, for smoke in particular, you know, considerations might be if the smoke hazard is severe and expected to last for more than a week, um, or there's, it's contaminated with a particular substance, like it's not um, just a forest fire that, um, like something else, another facility, for example, um, has been burned, um, or there's a particular, particularly susceptible subgroup that can be evacuated. Um, but on the flip side, um, there's health effects of the evacuation as well, um, you know, from a wellness, mental wellness perspective, evacuations are really challenging for communities. Um, if communities are moved to a shelter facility that doesn't have adequate infection control, um, often you can see infections spread quickly in, in sheltered facilities. Um, and, um, and, and certainly, um, you know, may, may ensuring that people are um, able to access their regular um, care or prescription medications um, in evacuations is, can be really challenging too. So making sure that people are well from the non-smoke exposure perspective can be challenging in those situations. Um, so that is my very quick overview of, um, of forest fires and the smoke and their health impacts. Um, and so I'll just leave you 
very briefly um, with a one minute video. Oh no, I won't. At first I will tell you about the chronic health effects, just to say we don't know much about the long lasting impacts of exposure um, to wildfire smoke. Um, it's something that's pretty difficult to measure both at an individual level and a population level. Um, but there's possible links to things like the development of coronary artery disease, um, hypertension, and possibly lung and other cancers. Um, you might have recognized some of those um, um, components of smoke that I presented earlier are known or suspected carcinogens like benzene or acrolein. Um, and in wild fire fighters, um, we do see increases in risk of these diseases and their individuals who are most heavily exposed. Um, so now I will end um, on, a, on a very short video just from the Ministry of Natural Resources um, because I, um, they're the group who works to keep us safe here in Northern Ontario during forest fire season. And I think I'd like any excuse to look at a water bomber. So I'll end with that. So thanks very much. Can you hear the sound? Jane, could you give me a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. my first fire as a bird dog pilot looking down and actually watching the water bombers and thinking that I wanted to do that. <laughs> uh, that's, that's where it started for sure. It's a very competitive industry and I don't think it matters women or man, it's still competitive and you got to be good at what you do. And luckily I've been passionate and good about what I do. This past summer in Geraldton, I looked around the ramp and saw the plane I flew for detection, the plane I flew for bird dogs, the twin otter, and the 415 all on the same ramp. So I was pretty proud, yeah. It was a very proud moment. <laughs> it, was, it was sort of surreal to see it all go, oh, wait, I did this. It took 12 years, but I did it. So, yeah, it was pretty fun. Great.